This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. And my guest today is David Wiley. David is the CEO of Decentra Software, which is uh, a company specializing in blockchain and Web3 uh, scalable solutions, including uh, the all-for-one uh, crypto wallet, which I'm sure we'll get to in a due course. Welcome to the show, David. Pleasure being here. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to have you on, David. Let's do what we do at the beginning of the show. It'd be good if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, like to just hear a little bit of your personal story and the lead up uh, to you uh, yeah, getting involved with Decentra software. Great. No, I appreciate it. So I cut my teeth on DeFi probably, I'd say, two and a half, three years ish ago. Um, I jumped into the world of, of Binance chain uh, tokens, which is uh, pretty pretty rife with degeneracy. Um, but that was my first foray was jumping into some some random tokens and experimenting with with DeFi. Um, Invested in Bitcoin a long time ago, lost my coins, you know, how the story goes. Um, don't even know how much I lost or care. Let's not go into that. Uh, but mainly DeFi, starting out as an investor and then um, actually joining some DeFi token communities and playing around with it and learning more and more to the point where uh, we decided to build a wallet. And so that is what Decentra Software does is we... We focus on the decentralized aspect by trying to build solutions that complement a decentralized blockchain crypto type thing. So for example, we have a self-custody wallet, you know, the whole, you know, your keys, your crypto. And so that's something that you can build outside of the blockchain that complements the blockchain, as well as we have a product called Ticker. And Ticker is a product that aggregates blockchain data and indexes it so it can be consumed by developers um, so they can pull for instance charting data data you can't pull directly off the blockchain um, uses sort of like a web 2 approach to to marry the two ideas and so um, really yeah my my story into DeFi, my story into crypto um, has been quite storied i could go deep into it if you would like but Long and short of it, um, I currently serve on the Blockchain and Digital Innovation Task Force for the state of Utah. We currently help with um, guiding legislation that's crypto friendly here in the state. We've had some pretty big recent wins. So hopefully that's enough backstory. If there's anything else you want me to go into, I'm happy to. Well, the only other thing that I'd, I'd ask about, David, is I, um, I'm told that um, at one point you accidentally became the CEO of a meme coin. At the time, I think it was called Useless Crypto. So, like, I mean, I have to ask, it sounds like a bit of a funny story. How, how, how does that fit in? <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I actually went to a subreddit for those of you familiar with Reddit social media. There's a subreddit there called Crypto Moonshots. And if you're into degeneracy and investing in tokens where you're going to lose your money, that's the place to do it. It's awful. But back in the day, I jumped into there and I saw a little token called Useless. And I'm like, this is perfect. It's a, it was in the days where meme coins were celebrated and Dogecoin was blowing up. And so I'm like, well, some little like crappy Binance smart chain coin called useless. Like this sounds, sounds wonderful. So I, I invested and I was one of the first few people to do so. It was very few people knew about it. And so I had a pretty decently sized bag as, uh, as well as a group of other people. And so we formed around discord and, we formed a community of people who are whales in this token. And um, the developer was anonymous. He uh, was kind of sketch um, in some ways. Like What a, what a surprise. You... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, he's a nice guy. It just it's not someone who elicited a lot of trust. Let's put it that way, right? Um, so he was anonymous. He didn't really want to do much or anything with the token at all. And, you know, so as part of a community member, I'm like, well, let's, let's go do this. Let's go do that. You know, I was really excited and gung ho about the first token that I was a whale in. Um, and again, nobody knew about, had no market cap. It just kind of, it launched and then just kind of stagnated, but man, I was going to 
do everything in my power to make this a success. And so I did. And so I, through my efforts, uh, we found a liquidity issue in the contract. And I talked to the guy who was leading the project and I go, look, you know, if you're not going to take this project forward, why don't you let the community do so? And so we formed sort of a group. We ended up relaunching the token under a separate smart contract that didn't have the, uh, the, the issues and the bugs that the previous contract had. We figured out on the fly how to like do airdrops, you know, and figure out and map the existing holders and drop the tokens to the right wallets. And it was, it was a mess. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff at the time. Um, which is kind of funny because last night I stayed up all night working on a smart contract, but like that's just back then I had no idea how to do any of this, but we, we did it, we pulled it off. And because I kind of was like the de facto leader, they enshrined it. Well, you're the CEO of a token, which if you look back at it, it doesn't make any sense. Right. I learned a lot in this whole process. Um, being the CEO of a decentralized protocol makes absolutely no sense. Um, and I know that now, but at the time being a neophyte, being new to it, it okay, well, if you're going to make me the CEO of a token, like, cool, let's build something. Let's do something cool with this. And so, yes, useless was extraordinarily useless at first. And then we decided to imbue functionality into it. And actually useless is um, ended up creating something that I'm really proud of. It's the first that I know of a uh, decentralized ranking system. So the utility of useless, which is very ironic, ended up being finding projects out there, ranking them, and then using the useless token as an intermedi intermediary way to keep track of the rankings of those projects and stack rank them against each other. Yeah, nicely said, uh, David. And I, 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 am I right in saying then that some of the lessons learned from uh, that experience have uh, informed uh, the work that you guys are now doing at Decentra? Yes. Yeah, so... One of the things that I learned from all of this is that if you're going to jump into the space and like try to lead a project or do something, um, I've learned a lot about security laws in the United States. I learned a lot about projects that do things the wrong way, that try to rely on hype and sort of this marketing, you know, hopes and dreams to people and investors end up becoming exit liquidity. I wanted to get out of the game of leading a token. Uh, to me, that really colored my experience of like, wow, like this actually is a, a really type of unsettling thing to be involved with if, because, I mean, you may believe it, you know, with your whole being that you're doing something positive and you're advancing the space, but there's a lot of people in the space that are very predatory. Um, and so even if you try to be a good actor in the space, it's still, it can be unsettling. So yes. It definitely drove um, me to be like, well, I want to create a business that caters towards advancing DeFi, but I want to get out of the token business. And so what we ultimately did with Useless is I wised up after you know some time and I'm like, oh my gosh, why am I the CEO of a decentralized protocol? It doesn't make any sense. Let's make it truly decentralized. So we turned it into a DAO. Um, and so Useless instead of like is a token, it's, it's now a decentralized autonomous organization. The token is the governance token. They're alive to this day. Um, they're very much unheard of. No one has like, you know, heard about them or talked about them. I'm not trying to show the project, uh, but they're still doing good things as a DAO and trying to build that ranking system and get that out there to the masses. Right. Okay. So uh, you guys at Decentra, um, you're building um, blockchain and, and Web3 projects, uh, you want to keep them decentralized, of course. And yeah, it's interesting that, that um, you said you're based in Utah, Silicon Slopes, I, I mm -hmm. think, in, in Utah. So, you know, we don't, um, we don't necessarily hear of um, uh, a lot of uh, crypto projects uh, that are based in, in Utah. Just give us a, a little bit of a sense of... Um, yeah, what what the what the feeling on the ground is in, in Utah? Are there um, have you got a little ecosystem running there? Yeah, so they call themselves Silicon Slopes because you know Silicon Valley, um, but Utah is a burgeoning tech hub for Web two. There's some pretty big companies that have come out of Utah, and they um, there's a there's an interesting environment, a very very pro business state in terms of politics and legislation. Um, it's very, very business friendly, very, very web two friendly. And 
there's been this um the synergy between business and government that I don't really think you see much like any place else, to be honest with you. Um, and it's it's done in a way where it's not um uh, how how would I put it? It's not like the industry drives the legislation or the legislate the legislation drives the business. It's very collaborative. Um, so when I was invited to be on the blockchain and digital innovation task force, when I sat across the table from the governor, I was pitching, hey, we should create legislation that would enshrine the concept of a decentralized autonomous organization and have that be something that the state supports and recognizes as a legal entity. And a year later, that legislation came out uh, just several weeks ago. Um, so it's, it's really exciting because they're open to the idea of bringing in, um, being friendly, being crypto friendly. Um, we're kicking around in the task force ideas of like even running our own Ethereum node. Um, so we, we really want to signal to people that Utah is a state that is very friendly towards crypto and welcoming towards crypto. And even the legislation that we built around the DAO stuff um, is done in a way where it's better than some of the other states have done. We didn't just copy paste, right? We, we looked at the Koala DAO model, which looked at creating something beyond um, an LLC wrapper. We actually created a fully recognized entity that's not a not a regular corporation or an llc it is a dow entity in the state and that's that's really exciting so so yeah to answer your question um utah is um less heard of but it is a, a growing hot spot in terms of technology and the state is hungry like all the investors here are hungry for utah to be the next big tech hub um the citizenry the government there's nonprofit entities um one called silicon slopes that that really helps bridge um, the gap between industry and uh, and government here, and it's it, it's very 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 friendly for it. So, um, just the fact that we have a dedicated task force specifically to talk about digital innovation and crypto is, uh, I th I think, really exciting. Yeah, great. And um, look, I, I don't know if these guys are competitors of yours or not, but funnily enough, just last week I um, I had on. Uh, I think uh, Eric Parker and Ethan Parker, they're, they're brothers. Yeah. They're, you, do you know those guys? They're in yeah. um, Arizona. Yeah, Dave, which is... Dave Lemke uh, actually is, um, so you're talking about Giddy, right? Yes. Yeah, so Dave Lemke works at Giddy, and he's also on the Blockchain and Digital Innovation Task Force for the state of Utah. And so I've talked with Dave. I really like Dave. Brilliant guy. Um, and so, yes, there's... Um, there's another company here called uh, Giddy here in Utah that has their own self-custody well. And they, they do things a little different than us. They're more focused on the staking. Uh, they're more focused on the Polygon experience, the gasless experience, things like that. And so I uh, love the Giddy guys. They're great. Um, and I think that they're definitely a, a force for good here in Utah as well. Great to hear. And look, not to get too, I guess, deep into the kind of the, the politics of everything, but it, it does, you do get the sense just in recent weeks, um, if you believe some of the, the higher profile people on Twitter, you know, that um, the US appears to be uh, perhaps ramping up, um, to use a cliche, the war on crypto, you know, some of those uh, crypto friendly banks um, were effectively shut down. It does seem, and, and certainly in some states, or perhaps at the, uh, you know, the the higher levels of of the U.S. Uh, government complex, as it may be, that there's um, a, an anti crypto feeling. Perhaps it's coming out of the Biden ad administration is is the best way of saying it. But I know that the, the different states, like Texas, is is very Bitcoin friendly. For example, it sounds like um, Utah, Arizona. Um, a little bit more crypto friendly as opposed to uh, the likes of um, yeah the Biden administration and Elizabeth Warren and so on, right? Yeah, um, I, I I do think that some of it is like for example some of the banks being shut down that were crypto friendly. I don't think it has anything to do with crypto. I think it just by the fact that they you know they do bridge a lot of the centralized stuff with you know stable coins or other exchanges and things like that. I think that's more of um, a symptom of the underlying problem with our centralized banking system here in the US and um, the fact that we've been raising interest rates like crazy and you have all these liabilities on their books now with their these treasury bonds. And I don't want to get too deep into that, but I feel like just the fact that some of these banks deal with crypto, it's like, 
whoop de doo banks deal with startups, banks deal with innovation, and there's a lot of innovation in Web3 and crypto. So um, that piece, I don't necessarily think feel as targeted. I feel like that's just an example of banks, bank, banks failing in the traditional banking system, which I think is more of a green light for crypto than anything else. Now, when it goes to like the SEC and enforcement and all that, I, I blame FTX. You know, this whole FTX implosion is like a Chernobyl for crypto. Um, and we can, just to draw the analogy out a little bit more, you know, you can have all these really amazing things with nuclear power. You know, you can um, get away from uh, for, from regular fossil fuels. Uh, there's a ton of technology and growth and industry and like so many cool things you can do, a lot less pollution, blah, 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 with nuclear power. And then there's a meltdown somewhere. And everyone focuses on the fact that there was a meltdown and then, oh, no, it's not safe. Oh, no, it's not good. And people who don't understand that the problem itself wasn't the fact that it was crypto, it was centralization in crypto. It was the fact that FTX was holding people's crypto assets custodially. And so like we spend all this time in, in the whole crypto dimension trying to get away from everything that's the madness that's happening over in the regular banking system and fiat currency. And then we go into crypto and we, we do the same thing. We set these exchanges up to centrally hold our assets and then potentially run away with it or not. I've always said that regulation is the crown of shame that you wear for centralizing things in crypto. Yes, if you have a centralized exchange, you're custodially holding people's assets, you deserve to be regulated. And so I'm a huge decentralization advocate. And what's cool about DeFi is that you don't have to regulate it. So I'm not saying I'm coming in being pro-regulation. I'm saying that if you're going to bring centralization in the crypto, you deserve to be regulated. But if you bring decentralization in crypto, you do things non-custodially, self-custodially, right? You deal with decentralized exchanges, decentralized protocols, smart contracts, code is law. You don't need the government to step in and protect you, quote unquote, because you're protecting yourself. Yeah, very, very well said, uh, David. Thank you for that. Let's let's take it back to Decentra then. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the All for One wallet uh, in a second, but just give us uh, a little bit more detail, if you like, on Decentra, uh, who you guys are, what what is the vision, uh, size of the team, uh, yeah, just all, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so Decentra, we're we're still in the startup phase. Uh, we are pre-funding, fully bootstrapped. Um, so we have the All for One app, which is one of our products, one of our brands, currently available on iOS and Android. Um, so it is a self-custody wallet. Um, some of the key features of it is we actually originally built it as a charting application. So one of the things that we found were lacking at the time when we delved into building this app was that we'd have to go to things like PooCoin or Bog Finance or Dex Screener to like research tokens and DeFi, DeFi coins and things like that. Um, you, we would have to research liquidity pools and things like that. And this was all something to have to do on, on my web browser. So when we built this app, the idea was let's create a really rich charting application that allows for people to see liquidity pool charts and graphs, allows people to see you know, the biggest whales, the top 50 whales for a particular DeFi token. I wanna to see transactions on the blockchain and click on it and go to the blockchain explore. These were things that we built this app originally for. And then we decided, well, wouldn't it be cool if we had a buy button? And that opened like a whole new reality of like, oh man, like, well, if we had a buy button, we have to have a wallet, right? Because we obviously, um, we don't want to redirect them to like a dApp. We, we would want the experience to be as seamless as possible. So when we built all for one, we go, okay, well, let's, let's do it. Let's create a, a non-custodial multi-chain wallet. So we did. And we built it from scratch. A lot of these wallets that are built out there, you see are forks of trust wallet um, that are just kind of reskinned. We really built this thing up from the ground up using best practices. I've been in software development now for the past 15 years. And um, some of the people that are involved in this project are deep into DevOps and security um, for billion dollar companies. So we, we know what we're doing, but we, we built this thing out and now we have this multi-chain wallet and we have it in a way that's formatted a little bit differently. We roll up all your assets on all your chains and all your wallets. So you can see kind of a bird's eye view. 
Um, and so that's kind of where we started. The company started was building this, this really cool self-custody wallet that was really focused on the charting experience. Um, and then as we delve deeper into it, we just added more and more features to make it more and more competitive. And we ended up with a product that we're, we're really proud of. And interestingly enough, no one has heard of yet because we're just putting those final touches on to make it, you know, really, really stand out. Like there's some missing things in there. Like we don't have NFT showing yet and that's coming soon. And we don't have wallet connect implemented yet. And like with those two things, we're, we're ready to go. And interesting. So who would you say then is uh, the target user uh, for the all for one app or the, for the all for one uh, wallet, David? Do you, do you have a, a particular a segment of, of the crypto market that, that this is aimed at? Well, and it's interesting you bring this up because I think some people make the mistake of targeting exclusively at crypto veterans. They'll make the the really dense application that um, is rich full of features, but doesn't have any like curbside appeal to your mom or your brother or your aunt or your uncle or whatever. Um, I also think on the flip side, the pendulum can swing the other way. And you have an app that's really focused on dumbing down the experience to the point where you abstract all that stuff away. Um, so for example, you know, um, social sign-on is really cool. It's really compelling. You see a lot of wallets coming out like Harmony's um, One Wallet, Timeless Wallet, whatever, um, where they have this experience where you you know, log in with your socials and then it sets up a wallet for you and uses Shamir secret sharing to break it in different shares. And, you know, there's all this technical stuff that it does, but at the end of the day, you don't have to like set up a seed phrase or manage a seed phrase, or if you lose your seed phrase, you can recover it. That's really cool for new users in the crypto. But the problem is if you're a crypto veteran and you come across a wallet like that, well, you know, you don't, you're like, just let me put in my seed phrase or let me put in my private key. Right. I don't want to like, I don't want to deal with that. Um, so that's what we decided was to actually do both. So we have the, um, we target the new people, but we also target the people who are crypto veterans and understand what they're doing. And the philosophy behind that is that if we bring in the crypto veterans, who are they going to share it with? They're going to share it with the people who aren't super into crypto. So getting people kind of into the app, we figured those would be more towards the crypto veterans, but once we get those people in the app, we want it to go viral. And the best way to go viral is to have it be easy enough for other people to jump in and explore DeFi with. So the answer is both crypto veterans and new newcomers, because we give the ability for newcomers to sign to do the single sign-on um, with Shamir Secret Sharing. We use Web3 Auth as a provider for that. So it's well audited, well known. Um, but for those who already have private keys or seed phrases, prefer that methodology, then you could just go through and do it that way. Fantastic. And so you said, uh, David, that you're still, um, I guess, stealth mode, we can say, just as you, uh, yeah. you know, polish off uh, the existing features and, and add uh, one or two more features then. So I suppose, you know, what's, what is the plan? How, how do you um, get this thing out there and try and um, get on the uh, get on the new user uh, growth curve and and start getting those users. It's a, it's a you know it's it's, it's a competitive marketplace now. It is, um, and it's also of course uh, what's well, a tricky time in the market as well. So um, yeah, it's a, it's 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 a difficult time to kind of get that zero to one a moment and get that product market fit. Um, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, the way that I'm looking at it is um, from, from a business perspective, right, because our operational costs are so low, um, I'm refining the formula, right? Um, when there's, I think that there's people who might create an imperfect product, don't have quite the perfect product market fit, and they go, cool, ship it, and then throw money at it. And the problem that I see with that is you need an element of organic growth to your to your application, to your product. So if I were to launch an app that um, they call it the viral coefficient, right? Um, the K value, that if I were to launch an app, how many, uh, for every person that I bring in, how many people do they bring in? And if the answer is I bring in 10 people and those 10 people bring in five people, that's a 0.5 viral coefficient, right? Um, 
what that means is I can throw money at it and it makes it more efficient for me when I throw money at it. I can like do the math and be like, okay, if I bring in a consumer, you know, uh, bring in a, bring in a customer, how much money will they make for us a long time? Is that, you know, you do the math when you do paid advertising, right? Um, but I think the beauty and the magic happens when you have such a good product market fit that your viral coefficient goes above one. So for every user you bring in, they bring in 1.1 or 1.2. And so you don't have to go out and market to the world when you have a damn good product. And so that's my goal is not necessarily to go out and hype and market this up because I can throw money at it all day long. Um, we can go on all these things and tours and explain how cool the product is. But at the end of the day, if people who use it don't share it with other people, then it's it's just throwing money after bad money. Um, and so that's my goal is to basically let's save our resources. Let's be smart about this. Let's create the best product that we possibly can. That is really like the Robin Hood of crypto that makes it so um, welcoming for people to use. They enjoy using it so much. They share it with other people. It's like the de facto thing that you use. And so if you have the product, you like it, you're going to share it with other people. If you don't it has problems, you stop using it, then that's the product's fault. It's not a marketing failure. So um, I do think that there is a point um, where we have good enough products and features, even if we don't have that magical one viral coefficient, we can still hit the ground running and still throw some marketing money at it, still get a good foundation um, as we continue to iterate. Well, I hope you guys do well, because from what I can see, um, yeah, the all for one app slash wallet that does look uh, like uh, a 60 piece of software, Dave. And it reminds me, I'm sure you're familiar with the Exodus wallet, but when, mm -hmm. when the Exodus wallet first shipped, you know, three or four years ago, it was probably one of the first wallets to have a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a UI UX that felt a, a little bit slick and sexy web too, if you like. And they had the, the key kind of viral moment or piece of product magic in that wallet was when you got a deposit, it made this really nice, distinctive uh, sound. And just based on that sound, I would have, uh, I, you know, in those early days, that was the wallet that I uh, recommended to people um, simply because that experience uh, just had a touch of that product magic. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw, you know, with the advent of um, like Apple's philosophy of the user experience being king. Um, and we keep talking, uh, we keep talking and talking about how difficult it is to get into DeFi. I mean, it is crazy. When I first joined the experience, and I'm not going to mention the token because it's embarrassing, but when I first tried to buy my first DeFi token, here was my experience. I, I went to go and buy it and I, I hit a brick wall. They're like, you need to go through and do this. So there's like online guides written on how to do it. And I go, okay, I have to go to Binance. Okay. So I went to Binance. I created an account, went through the whole KYC process, put in money, realized I had to wait 10 days to withdraw it from the, from the exchange. I'm like, Ugh. so then I went to Coinbase, another centralized exchange. And I was like, okay, well, I'll do it in, in Coinbase. So I set up, did my KYC, put money in. I could only pull out 700 bucks at a time per day, but that was cool enough. But Coinbase didn't support the BSC coin, right? Um, Binance Smart Chain. So I was like, ah. so I had to send over um, some Ethereum over to Binance and then swap it for Binance. Well, Binance is split in two chains, right? BNB chain and Binance Smart Chain. Um, and so I had to, at the time, they didn't allow me to buy BSC directly off, off Binance.us. So I, swap, I, I moved over my Ethereum to Binance, then I swapped it from uh, uh, from regular BNB to uh, the, the BEP20, you know, smart chain. And then I had to uh, send it over to Trust Wallet um, as regular BNB and swap it over to BSC. And then I had to go to a D app. Then I had to connect my wallet. And then I had to finally buy that. It took me like a week to do this. And so many people, smart people, because um, my network has always been in software engineering. So I brought a lot of people into crypto who are software engineers. It would take them a few days to get into it. And that process has definitely improved. Um, with fiat on ramping into crypto wallets and things like that. Um, but man, the problem is still there where, you know, someone who comes up with that really good solution that just makes it really seamless and effortless, but also 
allows for people who are already in crypto to have a familiar experience. If you can find that magic mm. and create a really good, clean, slick, smooth user experience and not rake people over the coal of fees, I think you have a winning formula. Yeah, you, I mean, you've, you've really... Um explained the the problem if you like really well uh david but it, uh, the reason why it's a problem of course is there are so many trade-offs when you're dealing with you know decentralized blockchains effectively and mm -hmm. you know the more that you abstract away the complexity um sometimes the closer you get to a kind of a some kind of centralized system so it's all it's all those trade-offs but it does feel like we are just now in in that kind of transition from you know early um blockchain interfaces if you like to uh creating the next generation of uh, blockchain interfaces that are so much more a uh, user friendly and perhaps less forgiving on um you know things like uh the loss of private keys or, or seed phrases or something like that but you're right you need um well i guess there's, there's room for both there's room for kind of uh wallets that are designed for you know DeFi power users and and then wallets that are designed for just the casual crypto user um but there's a there is a demand for a sweet spot that can do everything in between Right. Well, um, right now we have two ways to set up wallets, um, but I we have envisioned three ways and we call it like the pick your poison method. Yes. Um, so it's it's sort of like easy, medium and hard. Easy would be do the social login. You can just go in, log in with Google, Facebook, credit, whatever. Right. Boom. You have a wallet it has a little icon of your like your picture, your profile picture next to your wallet. Cool. And your it's it's your private key, which is you know, have a share on your device and you have a share on, you know, out there floating in the ether and the two of them combine and make your private key. Relatively secure, a little spooky to people who are deep into crypto. But it's also spooky to go to our medium mode, right? Where you have your, your seed phrase or your private key. If you lose that, it's gone forever. And so that's spooky for people as well. Um, and then finally, sort of our hard mode, uh, we envision something called, uh, it's, it's really where, you have a, a fractionalized wallet where it's broken out into multiple pieces and multiple shares and you manage those shares independently. Like you may put one in a safe, you may have one in your wallet, you may give one to a trusted friend. Um, and these are our little seed phrases basically that you, you can litter around and you can combine in a variety of ways, like one in a safe deposit box, one you emailed yourself, one in your Apple account or whatever. Um, and when you combine like three of five or five of eight or however you set that threshold, then you can recover your, your actual seed phrase. And so um, obviously your power users are going to want to do like the Shamir secret sharing. Um, the people who don't want to spend, you know, a whole day setting up their wallet, they're going to, they're going to do, you know, the easy mode. And, um, and for people who I, I think, and, and that's the idea behind it is by having the pick your poison template, like here's easy, medium, and hard, but here's the bit, the pros and cons of both, um, or all three, that's what we envision is really the ideal solution. Like giving people the ability to make their own choice as to their risk tolerance um, and their experience and being able to support all three of those things, but having the setup be relatively easy is sort of that sweet spot that we're trying to make. Got it. Thank you, David. Hey, look, I was just running through your your website and look, listeners, the website, of course, will be in the show notes, but um, the Decentra website is uh, decentrasoftware.com. Um, the, the wallet website, I guess it's in, in the app stores, but um, the website is allforone.app. Uh, um, but there's, yeah, there's a couple of other intriguing, you call them brands uh, on, on your website. All for one, we've talked about the um, the the multi-chain wallet that is all for one uh then you've got you crypto ticker which i think you mentioned before veracrypt mm -hmm. and and bitrunner do you want to just really quickly uh <laughs> talk, I mean, these are coming soon so i guess these are they, yeah. this is your your product pipeline but it's public it looks like so yeah yes what? yeah so again decentra is a for-profit company and so when we put a, a roadmap out there and we talk about some of the things we're doing these are, are things that we've actively developed or have developed and there's no like tie to a token or anything like that and so it's it's fun to just be like you know here's what we have here's what we're working on the all for one wallet is out there in the open ticker um ticker actually started as 
a response to it's, it was actually Ucrypto. We started out building out the back end for Ucrypto, and Ucrypto was designed to be a competitor to something like Dex Screener or Dex Guru or PooCoin or Bogged, right? Um, so it was going to be a web based version of our charting application that we had on our mobile wallet um, with more power tools towards advanced traders and things like that. So when we started building out this product, we realized uh, we, we need to have really good data. And so we set up a bunch of hardware nodes. We actually have nine hardware nodes currently running in Lance's basement on Business Fiber. It's actually, it sounds like a jet engine down there. It's crazy. Um, and we, we threw a lot of money at the hardware to get all this stuff running properly. But what we're actually doing is we're listening to events on the chain real time. And we are storing that into a time series database. And then we're querying that data after the fact that we're indexing all this charting data that we are going to do. And we realized like, wow, this creates really rich charting data that we can use for our mobile app. We also can use it as a foundation for this web-based app that we're still building. Um, and so that's where the idea of Ticker came from. It's like, wow, like if we needed to use this, other developers need to use it as well. And so that's why we, we built out this subscription-based API model with Ticker is so that developers who want this index data can just hit our APIs and get this to build their own tools um, for DeFi charting applications, or it could be maybe they have a particular token that they're watching, or maybe it's DEX data that they're pulling information from, aggregate DEX in information. Um, so like all this stuff that people are looking for that they can't just query the blockchain and get the data for, they can come to us and pay for a subscription and get that kind of stuff. So that's what Ucrypto is, is that, you know, it's that charting application that we're building still. Um, and then BitRunner, <laughs> BitRunner was actually a product that we, um, that was my startup that I had that I, I turned on its head um, when I got into crypto. So BitRunner was a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, a lot like TaskRabbit, right, where, or Fiverr, where it connects people with services. And so the idea was to compete in that market. And then um, I took our whole team and we stopped everything we were doing and we said, what's Pivot? We're building this app. We're building the all-for-one, you know, charting app and crypto wallet. Um, and BitRunner was 95% done. The only thing we didn't implement was the payment methodology, which we were going to use Stripe for. So what we decided is like, oh my gosh, like when we're ready, we can take BitRunner and then we can make it Web3. And so we could have this sort of Fiverr services marketplace, but it is... Its niche is it's Web3. The payments are in crypto. People get paid in crypto. Um, and you can implement that with the all for one wallet. You can use ticker data. Um, so we're sitting on this app that we didn't release that I pivoted from that is, like I said, 95% done. And when we're ready, we're going to make it live so that not only do we have a wallet and a charting application, not only do we have like a web based charting application. Um, not only do we have Ticker as like providing data for developers, but now we have a services marketplace that's Web3. That's pretty cool. Uh, very cool. Very cool indeed, uh, David. All right. Well, uh, just to, to finish off, it's, it's been fantastic talking to you today. Again, I guess I would just invite you to uh, make the case uh, for uh, why people should check out um, the All for One uh, app and um, yeah, some of the some of the key differentiating, uh, I guess, product features uh, that are available. Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned is that um, that you have this idea that the more you abstract away DeFi, the more centralized it gets. Um, so that our namesake Decentra is truly our namesake. I am a fierce decentralization advocate. So our app, we don't connect up from any to any centralized exchanges, except for the necessary pieces like fiat on-ramping or off-ramping. Like there's no avoiding centralization when you switch fiat to crypto dimensions. But for example, we don't pull any CMC data. CMC data pulls data from centralized exchanges, right? We actually pull all of our charting data off of decentralized liquidity pools. We pull all of our pricing data, not off CoinMarketCap, not off CoinGecko. We pull that directly off of liquidity pools off the blockchain. So when you have your wallet, you're looking at charts that are reflective of what you can buy and sell on DeFi exchanges. Um, when you're looking at your wallet and your assets, that pricing data is pulled off the blockchain. So like 
the reasoning behind why we do all this is because we know that centralization is going right now it may be a vast majority of crypto is traded in a centralized fashion our goal is to flip that around where instead of it being 80 20 right where centralization is 80 percent and 20 percent is decentralized trading we want it to be 80 percent decentralized trading 20 percent centralized and our app by being able to buy and sell effortlessly in the app that's that's the beauty of it right that's the idea and the vision that we're really trying to promote is that you can give this to your friend, your family member or whatever, and they can easily get onboarded into crypto and they can easily trade on DeFi exchanges and they don't have to think of an exchange. They don't have to conceptualize a centralized exchange. And how cool would that be for DeFi? Is that you never have to deal or manage with a centralized exchange ever again? That's the vision. I love it. Thank you, David. Uh, that is the vision. Decentralize the world. Yes, it's never been a more needed. Uh, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show, David. As I say, a, a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, close it down uh, just by, I guess, yeah, telling people uh, where they can find uh, the All for One app and uh, your website, your Twitter handles, uh, anywhere else you like to hang out online, all that good stuff. Please uh, go for gold. Yeah. So, um... Uh, it's app all for one is our Twitter handler, tr tr handler, handle, oh my gosh, I can't speak. Um, I'm crypto Kark, C A R C on Twitter. Um, all for one dot app is for the app. Decentrasoftware.com is for our website. Um, so I hang out on Twitter a lot. I'm a Twitter fiend. Um, so, you know, again, at crypto Kark, uh, you can also look me up as David Wiley. No one spells my last name my way. So, um, W Y L Y, but no, um, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, thank you for having a, an intellectual conversation with me too about DeFi because that's what the world needs to hear. You know, all the stuff with FTX, all the stuff um, that people are looking at crypto as you know a nuclear meltdown. When the reality is the problem is centralization, and DeFi is the answer. Yeah. And look, just just to finish off, David, you know, I, I love it that you're a Twitter fiend. I mean, I, uh, I'm i a Twitter fiend as well, not so much posting these days, but just, you know, I, I was just thinking earlier today, you know, and I mean, I'm sure you're the same. We all have a kind of love-hate relationship with, with Twitter. It, it is what it is, but <laughs> it's undeniable, I think, that you know, if you follow the right people, it's sometimes it is like being two weeks in the future on Twitter mm -hmm. compared to what you can learn from, you know, the mainstream media or or other um, social media communities. Um, Twitter is just powerful for that, I think. It absolutely is. And so, yeah, um, let's get engaged on Twitter. Let's talk about the next big things coming down the pipe, because at the end of the day, like I have a company. Sure, right? Um, yes, uh, I've been involved in some DeFi tokens and whatnot. But at the end of the day, um, you know, and, and helping with the task force and things like that, the goal is we need to move the space forward. It's more than just the price of Bitcoin. It's more than just the price of your favorite crypto assets, right? We're above speculation now. Um, we are now trying to find ways to make Web3 fully accessible and to find use cases for it. And so that's what I want to reward are the people who are actually building in the bear market, trying to build functionality and move the space forward. Awesome. All right. I just found you on Twitter and followed you, David. So there you go. <laughs> All <right>. Thank you. <laughs> All I'll right. I'll follow you back. All the best. Thanks again, David. All the best and bye for now. All right. Take care. Good night. All right. There you go. That was David Wiley from Decentra coming to us from Silicon Slopes in Utah. Utah, very interesting, very, very interesting. Enjoyed talking to David. Um, yeah, so, hey, go follow him on Twitter, as I just did, at CryptoCark, which is spelled C-A-R-C. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Andy Pickering NZ. All right. Well, thanks for listening, team. Uh, we reached the end of another episode of the Crypto Conversation. Uh, please remember to subscribe to the podcast in whatever podcast app you are using, Apple, Spotify. Uh, but that is it for today. Thanks, team. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave. A new coin's here.